Let's start by stating the implicit function theorem. So uh, I also would like to prove the implicit function theorem in this lecture, and uh, that will wrap up our adventure in Rudin's textbook. Um, but it might run too long. I'm not, I'm not sure. I think it's a little bit long. So if it does run too long, I think what I'll do is just post uh, this entire thing as one lecture and allow it to count for uh, today, which is Wednesday, and also Friday. Then it's up to you if you want to watch it in one very long sitting or if you prefer to uh, split it up. All right. So let's, uh, let's go through the statement. Um, so I've got part of it up here, and I've broken it down into these assumptions and the conclusion, which I have not fully written yet. So assumptions. We've got a function f from an open subset of r n plus n to r n. So I'm writing this as r n plus n, and part of the reason I'm, I'm uh, doing that is that I'm going to think of points in r n plus n as though they are pairs. So even though the points in here are actually n plus m tuples, they're not pairs, they're not two tuples, I'm still going to think of them as pairs of the form x comma y, where x is in r n and y is in r m. So this is just like the notation I described last time. So that, that's why it's written this way. And I will always use the variable x to refer to that first n tuples worth uh, of components of this n plus m tuple. And I'll always use the letter y to refer to the last m tuples worth of, of uh, components. OK, so then think of f as sending x, y pairs to x's. That's the kind of thing that f is. Well, maybe that's not such a good way of putting it. Uh, f sends x, y pairs to n tuples. Maybe I shouldn't think of those as x's. So f sends x, y pairs to n tuples. So an xy pair goes to a list of n numbers. And each of, each of these mappings, xy goes to the first component, xy goes to the second component, and so on, each of these is a component function of f. So these are standing in for equations. Uh, later on, or soon, when we finish stating the implicit function theorem, we're going to view f as supplying the left-hand side of an equation that says f of x, y equals 0. So uh, think of f as standing in for a list of n equations, one equation for each component of f. Um, and the n equations are, um, you know, f of x, y first component equals 0, f of x, y second component equals 0, and so on. So think of this as a list of n equations. That's what f encodes a list of n equations relating x and y. Then, uh, so that's what we're assuming we have, and we're assuming f is c1. Okay, so we are go later going to apply the inverse function theorem in order to prove the implicit function theorem. And we saw in the inverse function theorem that we really need differentiability and continuity of the derivative. All right. And next, uh, assume that you have a particular uh, pair, x0, y0, such that uh, something is missing here. Let me, uh, let me split this bullet point up uh, like this. And what, what I forgot to write down is this. So assume x0 and y0, the, the pair x0, y0 is one of the points in the domain of f, and x0 and y0 are 
uh, related according to the equation that f supplies. So f is, is an equation, or a list of n equations, rather, and we're assuming x not y not is a specific uh, pair of points that is related according to that equation. It's a, it solves the equation. Okay, so you've got a specific point that solves the equation. A specific pair of points, x not y not that solves the equation. Then uh, also assume that this linear map is invertible. So this notation is coming from what we talked about in the previous lecture. So if you look at just f prime of x not y not, that's going to be a linear map of this type. Right, because um, the input, you know, f is a function of n plus m variables, and it outputs uh, n components. So the derivative, if it exists, is of this type, and the derivative does exist according to this uh, assumption. And uh, we established a notation where we said, if you take any linear map, let me just let's say L is in there, if you take any linear map L uh, of this type, then when we write a subscript X, that's going to refer to a linear map Rn to Rn, which is given by this definition. When you apply it to any vector H, you get L applied to H comma zero where zero is sort of a list, standing for a list of m zeros. Um, another way to describe this, and we will later want to describe it this way, is that, um, is that Lx, L sub x, is L composed with uh, the map that sends h to h comma zero. So you could call that um, well, we'll give it a name later, uh, but for now let me just write this sort of crappy notation to say the mapping h goes to h comma zero. So you can think of it like this. So that's what the subscript x refers to. So that's what's showing up here, and it makes sense to talk about whether such a linear map is invertible or not, because it is a linear map um, from one vector space to itself rather than from one vector space to a different one. So it makes sense to ask, is this invertible? We assume it is invertible. And notice that the assumption is based on just the one point, x not y not. So it's not, it's not making a, an assumption about f prime uh, on an open set. It's just at one point. Then the conclusion. Uh, what the implicit function theorem provides will be, and what we will have to provide in the proof, will be some open neighborhood u of x not y not, and some open neighborhood w of y not, and some function that I'm going to call capital X, uh, defined on w. So remember, w is a neighborhood of y not. So think of the elements of w as y's, as little y's. So this is a function, capital X, that takes little y's and gives you n tuples. I'm calling it capital X because what it outputs um, are things that you can think of as little x's. Okay, that will be justified by the rest of the conclusion. So conclusion, there are u, w, and x such that, now let's fill in the rest here. So uh, I'm going to write down three conclusions. Uh, the first conclusion is for any, so I'm going to describe what property this function capital X, the mapping from little y's to little x's, should satisfy. Uh, for any little y in W, so the domain of capital X, we have, first of all, uh, if you look at x of little y and little y, that pair, that xy pair, 
that's going to be in u. So at the very least, it's in e, which is the domain of our function f. And secondly, if you apply little f to this xy pair, then you get 0. So in other words, um, y and x of y satisfy the relationship or the list of equations specified by f. And finally is a uniqueness. So x of y is going to be unique with respect to having these two properties. Um, so it's the, the only, you could call it little x, so little x equals x of y is the only value of little x that would fit here and here and make these true. So to any, in other words, to any, for any little y in w, there is a unique little x such that uh, little x is related to little y according to the equations specified by f. So let me state it like this. x of y is unique with respect to the above two uh, bullet points. Okay, that's conclusion one. But the full implicit function theorem actually tells us more. Uh, so this is pretty great. This is already telling you about, you know, you can solve the list of equations specified by f. But the implicit function theorem also tells you about the differentiability of the solution. So it tells you x is, is a C1 function. It's continuously differentiable. And it tells you uh, about the derivative. So if you want to know, look, let's see, so for, for any y in w, x prime of y is, and I'm going to tell you about the derivative of, of x, so this is like dx dy uh, in some sense, so the derivative of x with respect to y, we're, we're going to describe that in terms of um, in terms of the derivative of, of f here. And uh, this is quite a mouthful, so I think I will get it wrong if I try to guess. So let me look at my notes and just fill it in here. It is this. x prime of y is this. Um, so these, so little f prime of uh, x of y comma y is going to be um, a linear map. So given any y and w, little f, that is going to be a linear map of this type, right? And we have this notation that we can, t we can for any linear map of this type, so let's say a, where I was using l before, let's say I had L, a linear map of this type, then I've got L sub x and L sub y. And L sub x I described already above. Um, and L sub y, I mean, we, we did talk about this last time. So L sub y is going to be uh, defined by the fact the is going to be defined to send k to L of 0 comma k. So it's like L composed with the uh, embedding k goes to 0 comma k. So that's that's what these red subscripts here, x and y, refer to. And our assumption our assumption which disappeared, uh, our assumption here is that f prime at x not y not subscript x, so like Maybe you can call that the first component of, of this matrix, the left half of this matrix, if you think of it as a matrix, is invertible. That is part of our assumption. But down here, I seem to be uh, writing in the formula, uh, 
the inverse of this, where uh, the derivative of little f is being evaluated possibly somewhere other than just uh, x naught comma y naught. So there's something more to prove here than what, what it looks like. It looks like I just need to prove that this formula holds, but you will see we also need to prove that this is invertible. Our assumption does not say this is invertible. Our assumption says this is invertible specifically when y is y naught, um, assuming x of y naught is, is x naught. That, that's our assumption. So our assumption is about one point, but we need to prove this is invertible for all the y's. Uh, we need to prove that this, this thing inside the parentheses is invertible for all the y's in w. So that will also be have to be part of how uh, u and w are arranged in the proof. Okay, so that is the implicit function theorem. So quick recap. Uh, given a list of n equations relating uh, vectors x and y, vector values x and y, um, assuming the equations are in some sense differentiable in the right way, um, and assuming you've got in hand a particular solution, a particular pair of you know, x and y that solve the equation, the list of equations, um, and assuming that when you take the derivatives of the equations, in some sense, the left-hand sides, um, that uh, you get the right kind of invertibility, then there's a way to solve for one variable in terms of the other variable in the equations. So that's what capital X represents. At least if uh, you force the variables to be sufficiently close to the solution point you started with, and uh, when you solve for one variable in terms of the other variables, you get something that's nice, nice and differentiable. And here's the derivative. It's whatever this thing turns out to be. Okay, so next time we'll, in the next video, we'll begin the proof.